Welcome to CardioCast for Friday, September 27th. I'm Dr. Jim Dwyer. This week, a barrier to treatment for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is lifted. What machines can tell us about heart failure risk in diabetes patients and how a polypill can improve health in low-resource populations. But we start with the finding that although women increased their representation in internal medicine residencies from 1991 to 2016, their entry into subspecialty fellowships went down. In 2016, 43% of internal medicine residents were women, up 13% from 15 years earlier but there was a similar drop in subspecialty fellowship participation over that same time, as noted by Anna T. Stone, MD, and associates in a research letter published in JAMA Internal Medicine. When the investigators focused on specific internal medicine subspecialties, they saw growth, although none of the nine subspecialties studied had been majority women in 1991. By 2016, Women made up more than half of the residents and fellows in four, endocrinology, geriatric medicine, rheumatology, and infectious disease, according to data from the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. But then there's cardiology. Its low rate of participation among women, the only one of the nine subspecialties under 35%, is in an important issue that the cardiology profession should continue to address, they say. Dr. Stone notes that many factors are associated with the decisions of medical students in choosing an internal medicine residency, including their sex, educational experience, views of patient care, and lifestyle perceptions. Similar considerations apply to subspecialty training. Beta-blocking drugs work as well at improving survival in heart failure patients with moderately severe renal dysfunction as they do in patients with normal renal function. That finding seems to solidify beta-blockers' role for essentially all similar heart failure patients regardless of their renal function. Dr. Deepak Kotecha of the University of Birmingham in England presented the study results at the Annual Congress of the European Society of Cardiology. Dr. Kotecha says the findings could reshape usual care. That's because renal impairment often means doctors won't prescribe a beta blocker in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Dr. Kotecha and colleagues conducted a meta-analysis of 11 randomized trials, including more than 13,000 patients. During follow-up of about three years, beta blockers' impact on survival compared with placebo was substantial for all strata of patients by renal function. The analysis also showed good safety and tolerability of beta blockers in patients with renal dysfunction. Dr. Muriel Jessup comments in an interview that physicians no longer have to limit beta blockers in these patients. If we look at the amount of data we have on patients with heart failure, with reduced ejection fraction and optimal medical therapy, it's very scant because these patients have mostly been excluded from clinical trials. So this was a really novel attempt to try and look at the patients with renal insufficiency to see if they still had the same degree of benefit from beta blockers, and they did. So we don't have a reason to ever withhold beta blocker therapies in patients with renal insufficiency. We'll be right back after this message. A machine learning derived risk score can identify high risk patients with diabetes facing a heart failure risk of up to nearly 20% in the next five years. The risk score, dubbed WatchDM, has greater accuracy in predicting incident heart failure than traditional risk-based models, and it requires no specific cardiovascular biomarkers or imaging. 
Starting with 147 variables, investigators at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston used a decision tree machine learning approach to identify predictors of heart failure. They distilled the variables down to 10 common clinical predictors. The predictors include body mass index, age, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, fasting plasma glucose, serum creatinine, HDL cholesterol, QRS duration, prior MI, and prior coronary artery bypass grafting. The researchers presented a study of the risk score at the annual meeting of the Heart Failure Society of America. They found that the five-year risk of heart failure was just 1% for patients with watch DM scores in the lowest quintile. That rose in a graded fashion to nearly 20% in the highest quintile. And finally, a daily polypill regimen improved cardiovascular risk factors in a socioeconomically vulnerable minority population. That's the primary finding from a randomized controlled trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Patients at a community health center in Alabama who took a combination pill for one year had greater reductions in systolic blood pressure and LDL cholesterol than did patients who received usual care. Vanderbilt University researchers randomized 303 adults without cardiovascular disease to the polypill or to usual care. The polypill contained generic versions of atorvastatin, amlodipine, losartan, and hydrochlorothiazide. Average systolic blood pressure decreased by 9 millimeters of mercury in the polypill group compared with 2 in the usual care group. Average LDL cholesterol fell by 15 milligrams per deciliter in the polypill group versus 4 in the usual care group. The investigators say the regimen's low cost and simplicity make it attractive in the face of barriers such as underinsurance, lack of income, and difficulty making it to clinic visits. You can find these stories and more by visiting www.mdedge.com slash cardiology or by clicking the links in the podcast notes. This week's contributors include Randy Dotinga, Bruce Jansen, and Mitchell Zoller. And CardioCast, Cardiology News, and MD Edge Cardiology are edited by Katherine Hackett. Remember, you can find CardioCast via Amazon Alexa, Apple Podcasts, Pandora, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you hear, please leave us a rating or a review. For MD Edge, I'm Dr. Jim Dwyer.